All right. Well, I'm Bruce McGee. And I'm Steve Payne. And we're back today with Maurice Rufin. Welcome back, Maurice. Hey, guys. Good to see you. Good to Good hear to you as well. Good to see you. I know. I saw hey, you reading. I think you organized the reading the other night uh, that yes. I attended. And um, it was good to see you again. And I think Christina Robinson was there. And um, mm -hmm. I can't remember. I didn't know personally the other two. I knew you, I know you and Christina. Oh, it was great. Addie Kitchens and uh, El Kasibu Harris, two, two great writers um, as well. Oh, I love Christina's stuff, man. She, yeah. uh, she's really good. Yes, she and is. All of it was good. Yep. I was thankfully, to thankfully, thankfully, y'all can get your stuff out via these teleconferences, you know? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's the virus. This whole, this whole new way of doing things, um, it's been working out pretty well, I think. Uh, I've been doing quite a few uh, Zoom or, you know, other video-based um, presentations. Yeah, the last time you were here, it was January of 2015. So it's can been five that? years, man. And uh, this is our first experiment in uh video like we've never been i've never been able to kind of crack the video um uh thing but zoom makes it kind of easy you just set up the call and then press record and it handles the rest um, yes. so yeah, that's been nice and we have a we've started a youtube channel now which we've never yeah. had before so or we did we had uh, uh me making uh <laughs> I think turkey and duck for, for uh, Thanksgiving. Um, my son and I were working on that, and that was maybe longer ago than that. Anyway, welcome back. Um, how are you doing? I watched, I watched a video the other day with 16 people, if you can believe, in a Zoom deal. It was a bunch of scholars doing something about, I think it was Jewish literature. I can't remember, mm -hmm. or Judaica or something. But anyway, can you imagine 16 people on your screen? You know, how do you follow everybody? Yeah, well, look, I, I have my LSU meetings, um, you know, like faculty and staff meetings. And I think we had one Wednesday, yeah, Wednesday afternoon, and there was 235 people. Wow. wow. It was like seven pages of like scrolling. You could see, you know, faces and blocks with their names on it and that kind of thing. Man, that one, you. I guess you have a leader and then they kind of throw it back and forth, but that one would be tougher to keep up with. Yeah. I was on a Zoom meeting last night that had a woman from Brooklyn and, oh man, you could hear the sirens just outside her window and she had that oh, look, like, look like people had after Katrina, man, you know, oh. her neighbor's dying right now and really tough. So how are you doing in New Orleans? Are you in New Orleans? I am in New Orleans. Um, yeah, you know, look, I, I tell you, I feel like, I guess telling the end of the story or what the middle of the story first, I feel like things are improving. I know that um, the week that the mayor did the stay at home order was a tough time for a lot of us. I think a lot of us were just feeling sort of depressed and, and you know, New Orleans is such a, a such a, a close community. The intimacy is a big part of what we do. Yeah. So it, it was hard. It was hard. You walk around the street and talk to people. That's what I love about it. You know? Yes. It's that kind um, of time. It's that kind of time. You, you're being penalized for doing it. I mean, because the virus doesn't like you to interact with other human right. beings and show any kind of care, you know? Well, it's still New Orleans. I saw yesterday a couple of <coughs> men and a wife wearing these um, uh, Crobeek uh, plague masks. And he was huh. in his uh, in his seersucker suit and she was in a dress and they just posed all over. Uh, yeah, we still get some of that action. That's that's real. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> we had on one of those old timey caps, you know, like politics uh -huh. wear. And so anyway, uh, you know, people still in um, David Andrews was having a concert in a house and they turned around the video camera and this lady on the porch next door, she had gotten her umbrella out and she was just dancing on the porch. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they may be you know, sheltering, but it's still New Orleans, you know, and uh, yeah. what I love about it. So uh, personally, how have you, you guys been doing during all this? Everybody well? Yeah, everybody's well. Nobody um, in my immediate family has had the sickness. We've had some other sort of health-related issues, but right now people are doing very well. I, I can't say that in my extended community. I do know some people who caught COVID, uh, most of whom recovered pretty well. Some people that I've sort of known just from being out and about over the years, a couple of them passed. And that was really sad because you right. just never know who's going to get it. And I think, you know, I'm looking at, I have a big community of people who I'm, I'm friends with or who I'm acquainted with. 
And I think it's definitely true that a lot of African Americans in New Orleans have gotten it and had worse outcomes. And there's a lot of reasons for right. that, down to people saying that they went to the hospital and they couldn't get tested, or you know they they, right. they weren't believed when they said that maybe they they, they had the disease. Um, right. And, and so those kind of things were really, really disturbing. Um, well, and we have terrible health care for uh, large parts of our society anyway, yes. especially the yes. poorer communities, which are unfortunately uh, hits the black community in New Orleans really hard. Um, well, you saw it. I mean, you know, when this whole thing first started and it was, I think the same night that uh, the present president uh, made his uh, emerge, <laughs> his first national declaration or whatever. The presidential then, apprentice, you mean? Ha! <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and then that same night, we heard about Tom Hanks. We all love Tom Hanks, right? So right. him being surprised. But then you started seeing all these other celebrities, you know, coming out and seeing that they had been tested or, or that they were positive. And we started to wonder, like, why was it that people who were basically not showing any symptoms were getting tested? And it really just exposed this idea of the inequality of it, that, you know, right. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know maybe you're poor, you're working every single day because you work in a grocery store, or you're, you know, you're driving a streetcar. You can't get a test, but if you're, you know, multi-million dollar, you know, legendary actor or musician, you can get all the tests you want, you know? The uh, vice president showed up in a hospital the other day without a mask on and yeah. I'm asking him about, about it. And he said, well, my staff and I get tested all the time and we're all clear. Well, right, why right. have I never even seen a test? You know, yes. uh, um, you know, I could be walking around positive. I have, you know, I'm the one that does the shopping in the family, so. The same yeah. here. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And yeah. then have to go out. And, uh, yeah, for, for my uh, household and for my, my elderly mother, I mean, I'm really like the, the arms and legs of the family right now. I go yeah. everywhere and do everything, you know? Yeah, yeah. I tell my mom I would shop for her, and so I wound up, you know, going to pick up potting soil, you know? <laughs> uh, oh, I have to do all the shopping because Bruce knows my mother's nearly 100, literally. She's 99. Yeah. And, and, and I, something, something else to see. You know, in our state, you'll have the large, the large minority community will be African American. Elsewhere, it might be Native American, like in Arizona. And yeah. I saw, if y'all saw this the other day, the, uh, this came through my feed. I'm a member because my great great grandma was Choctaw. I'm mm. a member of several Native American Facebook groups just mm. just to find out about the cultures, and and for personal interest. Well, anyway, I saw out in Arizona that people were lining up in droves mm -hmm. from the Navajo and Hopi communities. They can't get tests. Right, and wow. so they're dying like flies, just like people are in this state. You see, Jesus, it's yeah. horrible. I've it's horrible. heard. I'm not sure if the statistic is right, but I've heard that seventy. You know, I think black people about thirty, thirty-five percent of Louisiana's population, but they make up seventy percent of the COVID deaths, yes. um, which is what we call like institutional racism, which we talk about yeah. in a lot of areas, but it's in the <coughs> medical field. And that doesn't mean your doctor hates black people. It means yeah. we closed Charity Hospital yeah. after Katrina. Yeah. yeah. And 15 years later, there's a lot of people dying because they don't have access to health care. Well, are the two related? I think so, because that was just part of a larger project to make sure we've got really great health care for people who are rich and have good insurance. And, yep. and yep. therefore those people grab their guns and they go, you know, run around the streets talking about opening up the town, but the people who are right. dying right. aren't them. You know, they, it's people that don't have that health and haven't had that health care. So how many people have like uncontrolled diabetes yep. because they can't afford insulin or they can't go to the doctor and get tested for diabetes to start with? Um, or heart disease or anything else right. like that. There's always a mathematical problem there where there's a disproportion of people who are affected. You know, if mm -hmm. you had, what is it, about 32% of the populace in Louisiana is African American, roughly. Mm -hmm. It's a little, it's a little smaller percentage than Mississippi, but the numbers will be greater because just because we're a bigger state than Mississippi or Arkansas. Yep. And so you would expect just mathematically for, you know, 32% of the people infected to be African American, but of course that's not the case right. because of institutional racism or systemic yeah. racism. So there's the disproportion once again. And you see it playing out across the country. I mean, right. somebody, somebody pointed out how in Florida, when the Republican uh, politicians changed the unemployment system, and so now people are having trouble getting you know, their, their, their benefits that are due to them because it's been made more onerous to even apply for unemployment. In Florida. Right. And so then I think that, you know, the long story short is that it's, it's forcing people like to go to the federal government instead of to their own local government to get their funds. It's like, what was the point of that? You know, right. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, well and go we, back to what you said, that the benefits do them. This is theirs. Yeah. This is theirs. This is yeah. what they're entitled to. Yeah. And yet they're taxes. being cheated. Yeah, they're yeah. being cheated. Well, and you, know. you think how much worse would Louisiana be if we had one of those crazy Republican governors right now? Um, mm -hmm. Because they're pushing their people back out, especially, you know, the lower level, poor, you know, you've got a job without health care. We've got to open that thing back up because we don't want to pay your unemployment. Well, people need um, that. Yeah, it's, it's tough. You know, it's, it's, it's not a good, we're not handling this crisis well, but we're handling it in the way we usually handle stuff like this. Yeah, we're um, definitely being ourselves. I mean, this, this country is <laughs> yeah. yeah, be yourself, right. yeah. And the Republicans are being evil and the Democrats are taking a month long vacation and filling their freezers with ice cream. You know, it's like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> can you be more tone deaf? Where have you been? We yeah. need, but you know, they they both serve the same basic group of donors and we aren't it. So anyway. Yeah, well, yeah, the, no. the 1%, the 1%. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, what kind of ice creams in your freezer? <laughs> how many fr how many fridges do you have, by the way? You know that that is an appropriate question. I have two freezers, uh, <laughs> and uh, they they both have ice cream in them. And uh, let's see, um, my wife loves the cheapest vanilla possible. She likes that chemical taste for some reason. I don't understand. Oh it. my! <laughs> and uh, I ha we have some Haagen Dazs strawberry, and I finished off that uh, it's that New Orleans brand strawberry last night. So oh, what is that? I didn't know they had yeah, a New Orleans brand. Yeah, there's, there's a local uh, New Orleans ice cream maker. I think it's just called like New Orleans ice cream or something like that. And they have a full list of good flavors, including king cake and stuff like that. And, All right. And, uh, it's always nice to have that as um, a reserve. In the refrigerator. We've got um, Bluebell is not too far from here. So we've yeah, got it's up above but you, between your house and mine, up right by I-20. Oh, cool. The Blue yeah, I love it. It's a distributor. It's a distributorship for North Louisiana and South Arkansas and maybe Mississippi. But anyway, definitely for North Louisiana and South Arkansas. So and they anyway, ship, it out, ship it out of Ruston. I got us some vanilla, but I don't eat it much. I'm not supposed to eat, you know, carbohydrates and sweets anymore. So oh. I do cheat from time to time. I had a roast beef po' boy last night. If I'm going to cheat, that's how I'm going to cheat. That's right. <laughs> cheat. That's the good stuff. Yeah, I make my own roast beef and uh Every now, I also I'm <clears throat> in Yakamane. That's what we're having tonight. But uh, sometimes you oh, my have... mom loves Yakamane. Oh man, yeah. Uh, the first time I ever heard of it, we were in a second line, and um, um, I don't know if you know Laura Janelle McKnight. She's a, a I do. Oh yes, people know each other in New Orleans. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, we're both going along. She yells, "Miss Linda!" And so uh, I follow her out of the parade and. I didn't know who Miss Linda Green was, but mm -hmm. she's the Yaka main lady, and man, she was serving it up. <laughs> yeah, she was on one of those TV shows a few years ago. And did very well. Yeah, Shop we Shop. we interviewed her after uh, after we ate, <laughs> set up on the porch. <laughs> yeah, and I grew up in New Orleans East, and you know, a real big Vietnamese population. A lot of my classmates were Vietnamese, and so right. You know, Three or four times a week, we had Yaka Min in, in the refrigerator. And I didn't really appreciate it when I was young, when I was a kid. It's so sort of pungent and strong. But I right. love it now. Yeah, I like the strength. And it's, you know, they also called it old sober because it's, you know, your morning after. It's got the egg oh, yeah. in it. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, so that's what we're having tonight. Anyway, uh, you've written a new book. <laughs> huh. it, yeah, well, so it's in progress. So, I mean, you know, it's funny because. My book came out in hardback on January 29th, 2019, my mom's birthday. So that was a very auspicious date for the whole family. And the paperback came out um, February 4th. So it's been about what, two, two months or so, two and a half months. And um, I'm writing my, my second book, which is my um, short story collection. And it, I feel like a, like a real writer, which is a good feeling to have in one's life. You are a real writer, but you're also <laughs> a lawyer. So. Um... I'm showing the screenshot of it uh, yeah. for our video listeners. We Cast a Shadow mm -hmm. by Maurice Carlos Rufin, and it says a novel over on the side, an incisive and necessary work of brilliant satire, Roxanne Gay. So, um, um, and where can people buy this? So, you know, I, I recommend that you support your local bookseller. Um, it, it, it has been um, distributed nationally and internationally as well. So wherever you are, there should be a bookseller who has it <coughs> in hand or they can get it pretty quickly for you. 
And uh, IndieBound, which is a, an online service for ordering books from independent booksellers, is also available. So make sure you support those those local bookstores as much as possible. Right, because uh, they're really tough because they're all having to lock their doors, but they do still deliver. Um, yes. At least yes. our local bookstore does. And is it in a ebook as well? Can people like download? Oh, yeah. It? yeah, I was. You know, I get to see like my statistics online, and, and I noticed that the uh, ebooks have been selling very well lately. So people like to download it and read it on their on their devices. And right. there's also an audio version, which is um, the the uh, the voice actor is a uh, uh, a well-respected guy. His name is Dion Graham. He was the um, the intro announcer from the from the TV show Forty Eight Hours, the first Forty Eight. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And he performs that book. I mean, like I couldn't have done anywhere near as good a job as as, uh, as Dion did with it. So the audio book is fantastic. All right, because this is a novel and therefore uh, dramatic. I'm going to get us back. Okay, so um, that's a up. that's a real thing nowadays to get a good actor to read yeah. those books, you know, for the audio uh, versions. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I was first shocked they get an audio version because not every book gets that. And then the fact that they gave me a choice and I got to see what his, uh, you know, what, what his bona fides were, I was just, I was amazed. I, I could tell you that the, they sent me the audio file as they were working on it. And uh, it was like a five minute clip of him reading the, the first chapter, like the introduction in the first chapter. And I remember I was in my wife's office. She's also a lawyer. And I, I laid on the floor and turn the lights off and just like just put the headphones on or whatever I had with me and I push play and his voice sounded so magically full of like emotion and I kept thinking right. I couldn't sound that way if I tried you know right. in, mm -hmm. in, in, in a million years and so he's really really talented. There is something about a good actor being able to just like embody a role and it's a real like you've got to have a certain amount of empathy for the subject. <clears throat> It's not about all oh, calculating. You kind of enter into it, and uh, mm -hmm. like you, I don't really do that so well. Mm -hmm. So it's what they the, used to say about violinists and guitarists and any kind of musicians that mm -hmm. you have the good player and then you have the artist. You know, yes. right? Yes. And the artist is there's a guy. I want to say his name is Milt Bagby or something. Anyway, it's Milton something or other, and he reads a lot of these uh, audio books for the stuff. I, a lot of the stuff I read when we're off camera is like mysteries and adventure type fiction like stuff we would have read as kids and they say he's I've, I've never you know owned any of his material but they say he's a good audio book uh, actor or reader mm. I mean, he's really terrific but he's very in demand you see like this guy you're talking about i mean mm -hmm. people are dying to get him to read stuff that's in the mystery genre for example mm -hmm. uh because mm -hmm. he's got that dramatic kind of flair about him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. so tell us the premise of your book so you know, it's funny, I've gotten the, the opportunity to talk about it so much over the past year. So I, I try and think of different ways to describe it to people. But the, the basic premise of the book is that you uh, have a father, he's African American. Uh, this is set in the future, you know, 40 years, give or take, in the future. And now, is it New Orleans or is it just some generic American? It's a New Orleans type of city. I didn't name it for uh, different reasons, but. There's definitely a vibe I and mean, there's street cars and there's like parades happening and that sort of oh, thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I think that, you know, in, in his America, he is seeing that uh, systemic racism and direct racism has gotten worse. And so he's trying to find a way to protect his child, his you know, son, who's Nigel, is his name, from racism. And, and I think what he does is he sort of looks around and he says, well, you know, I can be an activist or I can sort of run away, but maybe the best thing to do with my child and this is, this is why it's been called a bit satirical uh, in a way, is that he has this scheme he launches to turn his black child white. In other words, right. look white, act white, to just not be on the radar of racist people. Let's and, name him Nigel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so he's, he's sort of playing that role in the book of, you know, I love my kid and I want to protect them. How can I do that immediately? And I think he just decides that this crazy, crazy, crazy plan is the best way to do it. But of course, it's not that crazy. People have been passing for generations, and there absolutely, were skin lighteners. There's hair relaxers. Yep. Um, surgery. I mean, we all remember the Michael Jackson transformation over the years. Yes. Um, so it, it, it's 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 something that's been happening a long time. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a surgery some Asians are doing. Have y'all heard about this? Where they go and they have some kind of eye surgery is a cosmetic surgery but they have that inner fold taken out of the eyelids or something so they don't oh, look yeah. as asian 
I mean, it's, a my, ghastly, it's a ghastly idea, but people are doing yeah. it, you know? Well, you know, put, put my research was going around the world, you know, online and looking at how different cultures try to change themselves. And, you, you know, you just see that like in Korea is, I think Korea is, you see the Korea of Brazil is the number one um, plastic surgery capital of the world. Um, and then the United States is behind those two places. And uh, I was shocked to see people, you know, cutting their inner eyelids out in Korea, mm -hmm. um, adding uh, bridges to their noses to make it look more Anglo, mm -hmm. um, changing the shape of their jaws, for example. Um, there's skin lightening creams all around the world. <clears throat> there's, you know, people changing the sort of broadness of their nose. So these things all existed. And I think part of the reason I put it into the future is I wanted to sort of like Michael Crichton, sort of figure out, well, if this disease of trying to make yourself white spreads and gets, you know, worse over time, what, it, what would it look like? And, you know, a, right. a time, you know, it's the year like 20, you know, uh, 2070 or whatever it is, you know, you have like DNA um, alterations and other things that you can sort of oh. change anything about yourself. So My son mm -hmm. did his science project on CRISPR technology. Oh, and CRISPR, one yes. yes. One of the uh, possible applications that's really worrying is the whole aesthetic you know i want my kid to have blue eyes i want my kid yeah. to have big hair i want to have, designer know, children yeah yep. yeah 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 and it's sure genes but they're being spliced and diced to create you know and, and it could be i want a, a football player kid yeah a basketball player i want a really really smart kid yeah, um, exactly. The Nazi dream, man. Yeah, exactly. And, and those you just scary for a long time. The idea that you could sort of um, breed people, the same way you breed puppies, you know, right. or so like cows, yeah, yeah, or cows. And you know, I, I was inspired by a lot of those ideas. Um, there's a movie called Gattaca, starring Ethan Hawke from about twenty something years ago. Right. You know, and that film is set in the future, and the idea of the sort of purity of the blood of the people of their nation, and it's just really disturbing. But there's also just this this undercurrent of it in our society constantly. You see it when you watch a commercial. And I noticed, you know, why is it that in that commercial for one of these Jamaican resorts, you know, all of the customers and guests are white, but then all of the mm -hmm. servers are black and then they're like, you know, extra dark skin. And there's like one light skinned dude, but he's kind of inside of the house. and like, what's really going on here, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid we know. <laughs> yes, we do know. We do oh know. Oh my God. Well, and, um, you know, in New Orleans specifically, you've had, and Louisiana in general, we have more mixed race people in our state per capita than any other state. It's not yeah. New York, it's not California, not even Texas, it's Louisiana, because from the beginning we mixed, you know, I'm part Native American, but hey, look, I look really white, right? Yeah. Um, and also our country wanted to minimize that so that, you know, you didn't get the treaty right that you would otherwise have. but. Um, if I were as black as I am Native American, I would be black. You know, the yeah. one drop. I, you were part of the Melanated Collective back when it was going, and their subtitle was One Drop in the Ocean of New Orleans Literature or something like that. And of course, yeah, we all right. know where the one drop comes from. Um, yeah. And it's funny because that stuff, it never really goes away. I saw uh, on Twitter last night, there was this thread about uh, Johnny Cash's first wife. And I'd never heard anything about this. And there's a picture of her and there's this whole backstory of, um, I think him being attacked in the South, you know, by people saying that she was black, but right. she, she called herself Italian American and this whole debate about what she really was. And it's her brother who looks totally black. It's like, wow. <laughs> yeah, they're, the, they're Italian, right? Um, well, and there's a case of passing, right? Um, yeah. And normally like we've read in our, anthology we have stuff about that and normally people would move away maybe from the neighborhood mm -hmm. but that was dangerous there's a famous case Chukutu uh that was this woman's name and she was walking down the street one day in New Orleans and a white woman married to a white man but a black woman calls out I oh, we know who you are Chukutu you're passing and so this became a infamous legal case that went all the way to the state supreme court about whether Takutu was black or white, and they decided she hadn't proven adequately her whiteness, which brought her marriage into, you know, their kids, inheritance, wow. all that. Uh, and it was a it was a local cause celeb. There were songs about it. Um, I'm writing a note to myself. I had not heard about this. 
Tukutu, T-O-U, C-O-U, T-O-U. Oh, hey, guess what I can do? Um, hold on. I think that we have something coming in English. All we have right now is in French. <laughs> I have the famous book right here in my hand. I'm looking at it. I bought last year. Haven't had time to read it yet. Wow. I'm always reading about three or four books at once. Yeah. But I'm yeah. holding William Wells Brown Clotel or the president's daughter. And that's a fictionalized version of the story of Jefferson and Sally Hemming. Oh, yeah. And their children. And this is a very famous 19th century novel, quite a good novel, has a great cover, and yeah. it's a, one of those Penguin Classics uh, editions, so they're very good, you know, students editions, and I'm dying to read it. As I said, I'm, I'm reading one mystery after another, so I haven't read this thing yet, but uh, yeah, this is a really important 19th century work of fiction about someone who's quote-unquote passing, so. Wow. And here we go. This is, uh, we, this is, um. They do. Um, um, it's it's a book in French by Creoles of color in New Orleans. They, uh, they is got that the Laissez-Nails? The Laissez-Nails uh, school. It's longer than that, but it's got Laissez-Nails in there. It's most yeah. of our Laissez-Nails uh, um, poetry is here, but they've also got the Tukutu affair, and uh, we've got a article we've got the poem i can't read any of this uh i'm studying french and someday i'll get there ah tukutu <laughs> uh how white wow. i do recognize that so anyway um going on for a while right um yeah. so, so most people move off but then they experience kind of a social death yeah. um you lose you have to you know, stay away from your relatives and your friends. Um, cut yourself you're un, you're unmoored, so to speak, or untethered to the yeah. community. You know? it's, it's like, really, it's like a ship without an anchor. You know, it's lost its anchor. There's also the story in that film, Imitation of Life, the, the second version of it. In the yes, the you know, Lana Turner thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the daughter has to, like, um, basically rebuke her own mother because she can't be seen as a black person. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a, that's a, Bruce, what was the woman's name? Uh, we, we talked with her about this. That's a, a character type in this kind of fiction, the so-called tragic mulatto. Right. Uh, yeah. Because that's what this Clotel, this Clotel novel is an early version of that American fiction. But you remember the one and she, she, what, is she a, a teacher maybe or something? But I can't remember what, but yeah, the, professor the somewhere. author was Sedona de la Husse. And, uh, yeah. She lived out in the swamps, but she wrote all these uh, uh, stories set in the uh, set in uh, New Orleans about the Quatron, uh, the Quadrones. It was a series of novels about women, mixed race women, who were variously, you know, trying to cope with that issue of mm -hmm. race mm -hmm. um, and being betwixt in between, and made them a special target for especially lecherous old white men. Mm -hmm. um, but um it also made them a target from their own community like um what was her name alice dunbar nelson yes yeah the former wife of paul Arndt dunbar yeah yes like, she wrote uh brass Inkles speaks and she said uh, you know she's a light colored light colored black woman uh and as such you know had certain privileges like the first day of school she gets called up to the teacher's desk because they're out of desks and She's small and pale, and so all the other darker girls at recess, you know, pick on her about being teacher's pet. But mm -hmm. She's able to teach in a school, um, which almost had to be lighter skinned to get that job. But she's so light skinned and so beautiful that when she comes to school in a new dress, all the other teachers, oh, no, it wasn't the teachers, it was, um, it was a newspaper said uh alice moore's wearing a new dress to school i wonder who bought that far <laughs> no way could you imagine being called out in the paper because they think your dress is too nice yeah i had a nice dress man what white man is buying that for you you know oh my goodness oh my goodness <laughs> but the flip side of it is dealing with these um like 23 and me and ancestry.com and people are checking out your dna and and this whole i think untold story about you know white americans who will see something in there genetic past and be disturbed by it. And then I've even heard rumors, and I don't know if it's true or not, but like supposedly there's a there's something that the 
online companies will do where they'll sort of block it out so you can't see it easily because they don't want people to sort of stumble across it and get disturbed by it. Right. Yeah, right by that, but I don't know how much that's really happening. Well, you all remember the Klan uh, leader that got his DNA tested and it turned out he was yes. partly black and he got yes. banished from the Klan. They didn't I have heard it. about that. Was that <laughs> the guy that wanted to start the ethno, white ethno state up in the Northwest, like in maybe in, in uh, Idaho or Montana or someplace? Is that the guy? I don't know which guy it was. It's been a few years. but uh, It was like poetic justice in a way. <laughs> yeah, it's like a Tarantino movie or something. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so, in your novel's world, the only way to move up, apparently, is to be whiter. Yeah. Um, like, your guy is a lawyer, but he probably had, there's probably some kind of glass ceiling that he wants his son to get past. Yep. Yep. Now, does his son want to be black? How old is the son in this novel? So his son in the beginning of the book is probably about eight or nine years old, and it progresses a few years ahead as it goes. And he's probably happy being himself. He, he doesn't want to change at all. And uh, his, his mom, who is white, coincidentally, she's okay with him being black as well. And so really it's just the dad who has these, these ideas and sort of pushing, pushing this whole narrative in the story. Well, you know, Following the Civil War, and of course, New Orleans always had a free community of color um, who were fairly successful, and that was true in Natchitoches as well, but there was this whole idea of the uplift of the whole community, mm -hmm. and that was almost immediately like betrayed. Um, black workers on farms were basically, re they weren't slaves, but they were reassigned as serfs, they couldn't leave, and yep. Um, they were forced into eventually uh, sharecropping, um, and again, really difficult to leave. Um, and so within a generation, especially after <coughs> Jim Crow came along, there was the idea of the talented tenth. Mm -hmm. We're going to get 10%. I think W.B. Du Bois, you know, as radical as he was, he actually talked about that. So, you know, most of us are going to be held back, but if we really work together, we can get maybe 10% into that upper echelon. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm afraid that today it's more like babe the pig. Everybody you know is going to be bacon, but if that one kid from the project can go on to be a football player, then that's the dream. Yeah. 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 Um, that's the that's what Howard Zan talks about, remember? I mean it comes up in people's history. It comes up in some of his other books too, that the system is rigged. It's like a it's like a rigged deck in the casino or rigged slot, you know, rigged slots or rigged uh, roulette tables or whatever. And you go in there to play and you're not going to win except for maybe the one person out of say a thousand or whatever that percentage is yes. will be allowed to win. And, yep. and Zen talks about that at great detail saying that we can then say that, well, the American dream works. Yes. It's, a Horatio, it's a Horatio Alger myth. That's what it is really. Uh, you know, Horatio <laughs> Alger, you see that in a lot of those books. It's the idea of exceptionalism. Uh, you can say that yes. things are, are not bad because we have a, we had a black president. We've got a black woman <laughs> billionaire. Therefore, mm -hmm. you know, the dragon has been slayed. Let's move it, move it along. And Obama was Babe the Pig, right? Yep, he was yep, the yep. one that made it. Just we're going to let one make it once. And then, of course, we're going to follow him with Trump. Um, just to make sure you know not that much has changed. Right, right, right. But... um. You know, and Obama, he was the, was it Jackie Robinson that had to be the first guy in baseball? And he, mm -hmm. his yeah. and, um, he had to be the best at everything. And, you know, President Obama, man, he was smart. He was decent. Um, he, he kept his, he bit his tongue for eight years. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how he, you know he that made thing. me think of Mr. Spock in a way, you know? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that, that he is was a like, great really, comparison. he was Mr. Spock come to life, man. Yes. He was so cerebral. <laughs> but still yeah. somehow likable. But that, that really is one of the things that shows you that it's not an equal playing field because, yeah. you know, somebody early in the previous election for president was saying how, you know, imagine having um, a woman, for example, running for president who has all these bankruptcies and a bunch of kids running around. And, oh, my God. And, and yada, 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 and how we would respond to that. And that just tells you that we can <clears> accept <throat> certain things from people who are sort of at the top of the hierarchy. But if you're not at the top of the hierarchy, we're not going to accept any of those things. There's a reason right. why you didn't. There was no president, uh, Jesse Jackson or Al Sharpton or Dr. King, because they couldn't be perfect enough to to, to Right. Them. And President, he must have a remarkable self-discipline to be able to yes. 
just maintain all those years, never had an affair, you know, yes. uh, he did, it's he incredible. kept it so secret, which doesn't happen, you know, uh, yeah. uh, never had some of these, you know, we never heard about his brother or his, you know, cousin having a job working for a Russian wall company. <laughs> right. I mean, look, I would give anything <clears throat> if Shirley Chisholm was president right now. Oh my God, she, yeah. You know, she was way back in the early <laughs> 70s, right? And she had no shot of even getting close to the White House. But she'd be so much better than even most people who've actually been president over the past 40 years. Well, I mean, you look at the two candidates who are left. Biden is better than Trump, but he's manifestly unqualified for the job and unready it's not to a pretty picture no not a pretty picture i mean and, and you see what nancy and chuck are doing which is basically you know uh, uh you know sitting around waiting to see what happens let's see you know just they they aren't you know you look at what democrats did during the depression look yeah. at what we're doing now yes no comparison no not at you all. know it's, it's just the idea that you know we'll just throw a bunch of checks out there and that's going to solve all the problems or I just think that it what makes me sad is that this country is full of a lot of great people. And there's there's even great people who are very conservative, who I don't agree with, but they're good people. And that in a country of 370 million or whatever it is, we can't feel better candidates for our highest office. And I think I it's a lot about us as, as a nation that this is what we've gotten to. Because we have better people than these two candidates. As, <laughs> as Ralph Nader keeps harping on, it's the it's the two party. It's the duopoly. You know, yeah. it's the duopoly that's really that's that's controlling the whole, not even just the, the playing field, but c controlling the narrative, well, and and controlling, you know, uh, everything the first, that's acceptable to discuss. Yep. In the first yep. week, they made trillions of dollars, you know, uh, shower down like, uh, you know, flower petals on the richest companies in the country. It's the rest of it. It's us. incredible. I mean, yeah. think about that. You, you could you could have solved the health care problem. You could have mm -hmm. solved the educational problem. Right. You could have sent us to Pluto and back a couple of times. You could have like invented teleportation. <laughs> you know, all the things we asked for over the years, we could have had for our society to make sure people could, you know, live good lives, protect themselves. We couldn't get that, but we got this in the place of it. And people were are talking on the TV about the miracle of the stock market remaining as high as it is. Well, it's <laughs> not a miracle. We pumped money into it. You know, yes. the balloons you know, leaking over here, so they're pumping more money into it over there. Well, you um, they can always suck it out of Trump's gut, you know, and pump it in. <laughs> he's, he's like, really, he just pump it in, man. Well, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, this idea of, 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 of a country in which people who are already wealthy can make money even when the rest of us are suffering. I mean, right. you know, look, there's a lot of billionaires who can buy things cheap now because everything went down. They, they can buy yeah. some property, they could, you know, whatever, buy companies and whatever. We were talking about that on your broad, you know, your uh, uh, telecast the other day, you know, that um, New Orleans has been gentrified so much. Yeah. And, you know, Katrina was part of, you know, disaster capitalism, but we're in a disaster. So what's going to happen? And y'all were mentioning, okay, well, it's going to be easy for the people with money to buy cheap stuff. You know, all of a sudden the housing in New Orleans is going to probably go down again. Well, who's going to buy it? Who's got money to right. buy? It? And right. it's, you know, same gentrifiers that want to move in and, you know, have a 10 o'clock curfew. <laughs> yeah, I, I was in a street in a not too reputable neighborhood and we got a big, you know, PD like, I don't know, it, it's this flying sauce. Have you seen those things that are up on telephone poles? Yes. And somebody from the community said, well, they're trying to gentrify, and so they want to, you know, bring the cops in and chase out the people that would keep gentrifiers from buying here and fixing yes. it up. Yeah. Um, and that's the that's the, the neighborhood right behind the quarter, you know, uh, French Quarter. Mm -hmm. And they've got this stuff. And so it's a way of breaking up a, an old established neighborhood. And of further extending the reach of the national security and surveillance state. Oh my yes. God! Yeah. You know, I mean, I sound just like Nader, who is a hero <laughs> of mine, but really, that's exactly what it's doing. It's extending the reach of the national security and surveillance state, which is a dangerous prospect. It is well, very scary, especially it's, it's, once again for people of color. You know, I, I, you know, people talk about white privilege, and some of our listeners may not believe in it. So here's the story. I had a 
2000 uh, Buick LeSabre, which is mostly an old lady car. You know, anybody else besides me and it is 75 year old blue haired little lady. <laughs> anyway, I, um, I drove that thing and I was broke at the time, which is why I had it so long. And so I had a light go out and then another light and another light. And three times over the period of two years, I had policemen stop me and say, you've got busted lights. Um, you might want to get that looked at, sir. I never got a ticket. I certainly never got, you know, hit with a club. I never got arrested. Uh, I finally got some money together and took it. I had eight lights out. The only light I had left was my left front high beam, which was off, you know, it had, uh, it was out of line. So it kept blinding people when they were driving toward me. So, you know, I got all that fixed, but can you imagine you driving around in that Buick LeSabre for an evening? It just wouldn't work. It just would not work. I would try to get from like my house to the French Quarter and I'll get stopped twice you know, <laughs> in, in that trip. Another example is they had the, um, you've had these protests up in like Michigan, and I think Wisconsin, for example, and maybe Ohio and other places, Georgia. And you keep seeing these sort of militia dudes out there with these high powered rifles. I mean, to me, they look kind of goofy. Like they were in like baggy pants and not in great shape, you know, whatever, but just, <laughs> Braided like, beards. <laughs> right, right. But, but in my experience, like the last time I saw a group of like black men with, you know, with, with those big weapons who were not in the military, like the Black Panthers, you know, 60 years ago, and they all got slaughtered. Yeah. You know, these guys just walking around like, like, why do you need guns at a rally to go back to work? You know, if the rally is put us back to work and they're putting the guns out, that doesn't make any sense. But if they got let into the state house of Michigan. Right. How oh, that... I think they were in Kentucky too, weren't they? Maybe was it probably. I, there's so many of them. I would not well, be surprised. It's mainly people with it's purplish states with uh, Democratic governors, so yeah. you don't see it in Florida. And for some reason, Trump's being careful with uh, our own John Bell Edwards. I think because Edwards has done the oh, gross thing, getting in bed with Trump. I mean, he does yeah. the dear leader thing and. God I think he's thing. doing it to play Trump. I think he's give to give John Bell credit. Well, he's got to play the dear leader, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, but he's playing him so he can help our people. If that makes sense. Yeah, right. Yeah. But uh, man, playing him like a cheap fiddle, you know. Don't ask me to kiss that man's ass like that. You know, um, there is no way. Well, just just to but follow up, John on Bell's your story, a better man uh, than I am. <laughs> there's a when when I was walking around the block before my back failed so bad, now I can hardly walk some days. But I was walking around the block one night, and I had a long, broken off piece of a broom handle or a mop handle, but that was to keep dogs away because mm. we have, and y'all know what I'm talking about, people that don't you know don't leash their dogs yeah. and then the dog is not under the the owner's control so it gets out wanders the neighborhood and bites people i've been bitten before yeah. Yeah. on my achilles tendon so i'm out walking around and so the law stopped me and not one not two but three patrol cars and about six cops or more hopped out and stopped me and then they said that they had gotten a call about quote a mad person roaming the neighborhood with a crowbar <laughs> oh. and i said does this look like a crowbar to you i said what does this look like to you well, if I've been, I'm kind of mouthy anyway. What right. do you think they'd have done to me if I were not only black but brown? If I were yeah, Latino, I mean, how do you think they'd have treated me? If I've I were been Mexican? taught to never you know? respond like that. I mean, you know, if, if if I walk around with a stick and they say it's a crowbar, I'm just gonna say like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like point to it. Well, oh, and, they, uh, this was absurd. And I told the guy, I said, you know, I've bit, been bitten on my Achilles tendon, and I got to thinking about it afterward. How would I've been treated if I were black? How, how would I be treated if I were if I were brown, if I were Mexican, you know, or any kind of Latino? I mean, I would have been treated like dirt, if not dead. And look, I'm not a gun owner. You know, I, I, I'm actually a pretty good shot, but I don't own any guns. But I couldn't even imagine having a gun permit and having a 22 little pea shooter, like a pink woman's pea shooter, and getting to the state capitol, you know. Oh, my God, no. You'd get shot. What happened? happened? They, they would say, sir, you need to put it in the car or don't come in or, or something, you know. Or, or they would... Or they would shoot you, you know. Uh, yes. We've seen cases on TV where, you know, you had a toy. Who was it? Tamir Rice? Was he the one? Yeah, the, the child or that little kid, yeah. yeah. Tamir Rice yeah. was a 12 or 13-year-old boy up in, I think, Ohio. And he, he, yeah, he yeah. somebody called on him. And he got shot like Tango and Cash style. The cops showed up in a car going 80 miles an hour. Didn't even get out of the car. Started shooting from the car. That's right. Rolling out. Yeah. And... 
Ohio open carry state. He had a perfectly legitimate right, according to their law, yep. to have a real gun. Yep. And there was a young man in a Walmart. I can't remember which state it was in now. Yeah. And I can't think of his name offhand, but he was actually in the gun section of Walmart. And he had got on his phone to talk to his mom or his girlfriend or somebody. And then some lady or somebody sees him and says, oh, there's a black man with a gun walking around Walmart. And cops show up and just shoot him in Walmart. They killed him, didn't they? Or am I yeah. wrong? They, they did kill him. They did kill him. That's, that's, that's why we know his story, because he got killed. Right, um, right. Yeah. Well, and that's where the Black Lives Matter movement came from, was cases like that yes. getting recorded, finally. <clears throat> because it's always been like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That, the purpose of the, especially like New Orleans had one of the first police departments, the purpose of which was to control uh, the slave population and immigrants and brown people. You know, they, yep. they were there to yep. keep, make sure the hierarchy was maintained, and they still are. Yes. I mean, it's only explanation for the way NOPD acts. Overseers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's, the, that's their behavior. And it's unfortunate because, you know, in a city like this, to put that, those many resources into a police force. I think I, uh, one of my earliest sort of moments of awakening was when I was uh, a nerdy high school student. I would go to the library and volunteer. I remember seeing a book on the shelf at the main New Orleans library. And, and at that time in the mid 90s, whatever it was, early 90s, I saw a statistic that said one out of seven New Orleanians had been in Orleans Parish prison at some point in their life. And I remember thinking, one out of seven, like, why is that even necessary? Right. And, you know, as you get older, you learn what's well, part of the system. You know, if, if you can put fear into people, put them in jail, uh, reduce their possibilities of, say, getting good jobs, getting good education, you get to sort of recycle them out to the community so that they can get these low wage, essential jobs. And you keep right. eating the sort of, Industry. Which are all about exploitation. Yeah, it's exploitation. It's all. It's just. It's all part of the same thing, and, and it still goes on today. It's economic violence. I've heard it called that, and I think that's a good term yes. for it. Frankly, absolutely. What uh, school did you go to? People always want to know that. Uh, high school, McDonald Thirty Five. All right. Yeah. Is that still going, or did they close that? Oh boy, I've deliberately turned away a little bit because it took them a while to come back after Katrina. Thirty Five, um, wonderful school. Uh, a great heritage of supporting young black people and supporting the community, um, founded in the early 1900s. Um, post Katrina, the Orleans Parish school system was basically eviscerated and, right. and, and replaced by this sort of Dang. charter system, you know. And uh, to their credit, I guess 35 got this beautiful building right by Bayou St. John, huge. I mean, it was. Gigantic, it, it, so big it had two basketball courts in the second floor, wow. two separate gymnasiums. I went there and visited, talked to the principal, met some students, great experience. And then what's been happening over the past few years is that they, they, there has been a lot of instability um, in the administration, and sort of forcing out principals. And my understanding is that what's the, the long game is to give that school to some other school. So it's no longer 35, no longer majority black, no longer a part of that community, and more for the community at large. And I think that that is pretty much what's happening right now. How much is the racial makeup of New Orleans changing with all the gentrification? As, as um, I know, there are like a hundred thousand black people that did not come back after Katrina. And yeah, that's right. That was part of the plan. Uh, yeah. That was an accident. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was totally part of the plan. I mean, you had people. I mean, unfortunately, I had to work with, work for some of these companies. You had insurance companies denying every claim that was put in by black folks. Um, if you didn't have like a lawyer to fight for you to keep your to, to get the payouts from your insurance, you know, you didn't have a chance. Um, as far as I can tell, between Katrina and now, it's reduced from say seventy percent uh, black population down to like fifty five percent, give or take. Um, and it's probably still falling right now. Um, I'm not exactly sure about that, but I just will tell you that I can see it in my own neighborhood. On my block, it was, I think, 100% black, and now it's maybe half black. Right. And we live in we live, we live uptown, which is a very nice area. The property values have been going up constantly, and um, it's just sad to see it. I mean, the whole neighborhood's changed. The the businesses have all changed. The soul food places are gone. You know, right. Replaced by like. Um, 
like literally like by a yoga studio mm-hmm. and like a vegan restaurant. It's like, Ooh. I can't believe this, but it's actually happening. <laughs> no, man. No. Where where did the the former black residents go? Do you know? Well, I mean, a lot of them were scattered to the four winds. I mean, my own family, my own extended family, including people, you know, my, my um, uh, you know, mother-in-law and her family and all of them. I mean, they, they went to Baton Rouge, Houston, and Atlanta if they stayed sort of close. And then a bunch of them went even farther than that. I mean, you, as far as Detroit, California, you name it. I mean, literally, you know, the storm happens. Uh, people are sort of stranded in the city afterwards because they couldn't afford to leave. They didn't have any transportation. They were worried about losing their jobs. Um, people who were like at the convention center or the Superdome or were rescued from rooftops were sort of corralled and then put on planes with no choice as to where they want to go. And so I saw that process play out because my mother-in-law and her family ended up in Houston at the Astrodome. And, and was there wasn't much of social media yet and people couldn't no. find each other. Couldn't yeah. find each other at all. I mean, it was like, it was like slavery, you know, when people were freed and they were trying to find like their husband who had been taken away years ago and sold down South. Yeah, man. Um, I, I, one of the indelible images that I remember from that whole period was going to the Astrodome and it was, it was sort of like a, a gathering place for them to send people other places. And so there was this whole row off to the side with these tables set up and each table had a placard on it and the placard had a state, you know, Hawaii, uh, Alaska, Maine. And it was kind of like, you know, you pick the table, you would go to that place or worse than that, in some cases, they didn't have a choice. It was like, look, sign this paper if you want to leave and go somewhere where, where you can be safe or stay here in the Astrodome, you know, we don't care. And so you would sign it and they say, all right, get on that plane over there or get that line for that plane, we'll take it to the airport. And uh, people just got scattered. And it was, it's, it's a complex thing in that I've heard stories of people who went other places, like Arizona, for example, in Colorado, who actually did find better lives. They had better education systems. They had better social support structures. They found good jobs. And the idea that things were so bad in New Orleans, um, because of the sort of plantation mentality, that they had to leave right. the community to find a better life for themselves. It's just so sad all around. Well, and it's ironic because finally, you know, enough black politicians had been elected that they could make a change to this. Like, why are you still pouring money into uh, New Orleans Police Department and local jails? Why don't you put it into education, maybe? Um, You know? Yeah, and and it's difficult because I, you know, I need to, I think that whole period of time between the election of Dutch Morial, for example, through Katrina, it's hard for me, and I know that there were a lot of black politicians who were really dedicated to doing the right thing. But unfortunately, the ones who had a lot of power were the ones who were most corrupt and the ones who were, who were, who were self-dealers and right. more concerned with the community. And they were more concerned with just gaining more power, gaining more prestige, gaining more money. And, um, and so they were playing the same game that their predecessors who were like the sort of white politicians were playing. Where it was like, look, you know, you know uh, in Miro, you know, right outside of New Orleans, the town, you know, right next to New Orleans, there's this long running story about the politicians who basically were able to swindle the land. So they became owners of this huge tract of land. Oh yeah. Made them like multi, multi, multi millionaires. And then over time sold like the oil rights and sold the land. They the Perez's rich. did a lot of that back in the Perez. day. Great example. And so taking the public trust, making it your own and then making your family rich. I mean, that's, that's just, it's just sad, and you saw it. It's a precursor to Trump, you know. Absolutely. That whole, yeah, I mean, Trump and Mnuchin and Wilbur Ross, uh, De- Betsy DeVos, that whole yes. crew, you know, taking their business and their model, which is fundamentally corrupt, and taking that and then reapplying it to the the federal system. Yep. Uh, to corrupt the system, which is already kind of teetering, frankly. We, we've yeah, seen we, it. It's teetering. We need to get rid of those crooks and put in Joe Biden so his family can get richer. Um, exactly. We need to put in Earl Long. <laughs> we need to put in Uncle Earl. <laughs> I keep saying that. No, but that's what they do. They take that corporate ethos and then they, you know, transplant it or do an organ donation or however you want to call it to the federal type system. Yeah, they they started got into the state office level. and said it's our turn, but by that they meant us personally, our exactly. families, yeah, but not the community. Yes, but Boris Johnson's like that. Shot. Yeah, oh Boris Johnson's like that over in Britain, you know, in the United Kingdom. I mean, that guy is so sleazy, it's just unreal. He campaigned nakedly, not trying to appeal to working men and women there in the United Kingdom. He was appealing to the elites in the United Kingdom. 
kleptocracy. Look at Trump. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And cacistocracy, you know, the rule by the most corrupt and the oh, most incompetent. Goodness. That's a new one for me. I haven't heard that one. Yeah. Cacistocracy. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. Cacistocracy. Yeah, yeah well, there you go, Bruce. Good. You know, the rule by the bad or the corrupt. Yeah. My goodness. And unfortunately, we've had way too much of that in Louisiana over the years. And that's why our people are backward because it's cheaper to bribe a politician than, than to pay your taxes. Um, well, then, like, I mean, this whole game that's been played for so long where they're not trying to make people's lives better, but then they can, they can play the, the sort of racial politics game and say, look, mm -hmm. I look like you, so at least right. I want to, like, make you feel better about yourself. I'm like, mm -hmm. you have health care education, but, you know, I'm going to make sure that you're above those people over there. And that, that's the same game we, we've seen played out for forever now. And it's, it's, just, it's just really sad. And well, I mean, like in the recent Democratic primary, we saw Obama come in at just the right moment to tip it to Uncle Joe, who will never, ever, ever allow poor people to get free health care. Yes. Um, you know, and <laughs> he, will, he will be so. Yeah, you know, we're not doing that. Uh, we, we don't want free health care. You know, uh, uh, that'll take too long. It'll take four years. And I want to do it never, you know. <laughs> um, and because he does have that association with Barack Obama, a lot of people will vote for him who will actually be held back by him. And he's campaigning on that promise. You know, I'm not going to give you anything, you know. Okay. Well, well it's sad because politics is always a trade-off. But what I'm worried about right now is that people do not seem very energized. And no. you know, when you we've seen this play out many times before with you know John Kerry as a candidate, we saw with Hillary Clinton as a candidate. We we saw it many times in the past. And I just Al think Gore, that Al Gore, Hillary Clinton. Example. So it, it, it's just it, it's not looking great. And I've got nothing against Biden, but. It's kind of like, dude, you got to step up and make people really get excited about what you're doing. Yeah. Otherwise, Start to offer pe gives people a reason to vote for you. But you know, Hillary was a what do they call identity politics candidate? I'm going to be mm -hmm. the first woman. Yes. And I'm going to do the same thing the guys have been doing. Yes. But I'll be a woman doing it, and so yes. that'll make you feel that's different about being a woman. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, I mean, it's so sad because. She was running on that identity, but what shocked me in the election was I would talk to people around town about it and how many women didn't like her. And I was like, really? I know, right? And I guess I'm not that surprised because there have been plenty of black politicians, but I was like, eh, I'm not so sure about that one over there. Well, and also there's been a 30-year right-wing propaganda Conspiracy. campaign against her. Yes. You know, and Hillary and uh, four Americans. Well, you know, the people that were saying Pizza that... Gate. Yeah. The people that were saying that yeah, just killed the pedophile as many, ring and all that business. The people that were saying that that just killed as many people in a month as died in Vietnam. You know, so yes. uh, don't tell me about the four people in Benghazi. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. But that became a stick to beat Hillary with, and uh, there was no, you know, it wasn't like uh, there's a left wing propaganda mill that would come to our defense that you had no msnbc is wheat tea and they're just well hillary email but trump corrupt so who can say you know who can say? <laughs> it's that limousine liberal thing i was telling y'all about when when i lived in boston we saw a heck of a lot of it up there you know the limousine liberal type i mean they uh, it's what my Harvard Divinity predecessor, Chris Hedges, keeps saying about the Divinity School and about Harvard in general. He mm. said they want to talk about empowering the poor. They don't even know anybody poor. Right. Oh. <laughs> I, mean, I could easily see somebody trying the same thing on most uh, Democratic politicians that they used against H.W. Bush, where they say, you know, Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden, how much does a gallon of milk cost right now? Or you know, how much does right. a loaf of bread cost right now? Or, you, you know, I think that that separation is the reason why we've had so much instability because even people who are on your side don't seem to really be from the same tribe as you. And, and I think that's why we saw people make these sort of radically strange choices because, I mean, look, say what you want to say about 45, for example, but he wasn't a Republican. And it's the same thing with Bernie Sanders. He wasn't, he's not really a Democrat. And so people are just sort of saying, I'll take anything but the typical AB choice, which has not yeah. been good enough for us recently. Bernie Sanders is a throwback to the New Deal. Uh, yes. And he's about how can we materially improve your lives? And it's the yeah. kind of thing we haven't asked here in Louisiana for a long time. I keep wondering, why are people voting for 
Republicans when they're against their self-interest. Well, yeah. when have Democrats been for our self-interest? Yes. I don't hear anything coming from that, you know, the institutional amnesia, I've heard right, it called. Right. The institutional elites of the party. Well, trust us, we're gonna ship your jobs overseas, but don't right. worry, it's all gonna work out in the long run. We're gonna retrain you so mm. you can have a you know some other job behind a desk somewhere. Coding for rednecks. Yeah, we're going to get rednecks. <laughs> well, and they're also, they're not going to protect the environment. You know? No, not at all. I not mean, really, there, uh, there's a book that a uh, former guy, he was living across town from you, Maurice, and he's moved to Houston, uh, Brinkley, uh, Doug Brinkley. Doug Brinkley yeah. yeah, he wrote a kind of a sequel to a book. I'm going to try to get him on the show, but he wrote a book about Teddy Roosevelt and the formation of the national parks, but he wrote a sequel about Franklin Roosevelt and his efforts at conservationism. That used to be a real kind of a central uh, plank of the democratic platform is protecting the environment. Yes. Look at all this business about cap and trade. That's not going to get us towards a green economy. It's just no. not going to do it. No. You know, when no. You, particularly when you've got certain industries like agriculture and even the military that use vast quantities of petrochemical products. Uh, I really don't think we have to worry because Joe Biden's going to uh, go back to the Paris Accord and uh, that's going to fix things. It's going to fix things. <laughs> we're going to be all right because Paris, we're, we'll always have Paris. <laughs> <laughs> Speak, well, speaking of which, so how, how does all of this kind of backdrop figure in your novel? Does it play into it at all since it's set in the near future or does it even come well, up or is it well yeah it does because i mean i, I think in the book what we're looking at is a, is a society in which people are being divided for the benefit of people who are in power and we have this idea that identity politics is about separating me from you and then saying the person over there is not as good as you are right. and i just think it's really unfortunate that we've gotten to a point where the simple ideas you know life liberty pursuit of happiness are being lost and my narrator is saying, you know, if my son can be in a place where he's not having to think about any of these questions, which is how it is for some Americans, they don't think about any of this stuff at all. They're, they're like in that sort of <coughs> spot that America has provided for some, some people. Um, that's going to be a good thing. And I think that, I think that in, in the book is really asking questions about what does it mean to be a person in a, inside of a nation and what does it mean to have a, to have a politics? Right. And, Unfortunately, like the same way we were saying to people last month in certain states, go ahead and vote. We don't care if it kills you. Right, right. We want you to go out there and vote. There's something in modern politics that's also sort of saying, you know, we don't care whether you vote for A or vote for B. Either one's going to mess you up pretty bad, but you must choose because that's how it works. And, um, you know, maybe you wanted a nice hamburger, but your choice is like a piece of cardboard. <laughs> or a rat's carcass. Right. Choose wisely. So, um, I see we've been going about an hour. Tell us about the other book you said you're finishing up or working on. Is it a collection of short stories? Collection of short stories. Uh, right now it's called uh, The Ones Who Don't Say They Love You, which is the title of a story I published a few years ago that won a prize, the Iowa Review Prize. And the collection includes stories that I wrote a couple years back. And uh, we're already published in stories I've been writing since that period. It's going to come out, um, I think, uh, summer of next year. Well, good. And uh, I'm feeling good about it because I, I love writing short stories. They're so fun because they're bite sized. You can get in and right. out pretty quickly. So I'm, I'm well, still writing stories right now. So let us know when it comes out and we'll let you uh, uh, bring you back on. Right. And uh, yeah, yeah. we can also put a note on our web, on our uh, Facebook page. We have a pretty good following there. Yeah. So, uh, well, stay well in all this. Uh, do you have anything else you want to mention before we get off? Um, um, you know, all I want to say to people is uh, we always live in an interesting time. It's always one thing after another. <laughs> this is a particularly strange time because we're so separate. But just be kind to each other. You know, uh, protect your household, wash your hands. Don't let anybody brainwash you. And you know, if you feel like things are not going well or they're, you're confused, that's usually a sign of something that, that's going on you should pay more attention to. So, so for myself, I've been very grounded, you know, looking at my household and mm -hmm. reading books that I love and making sure that the information I have is, is good information, not people just like making up these theories about this disease. Um, so just, you know, eat well, hydrate. Listen properly. to the scientists. <laughs> Listen to the scientists, you know, take your proper medications and 
we're going to get through this thing um, changed, but um, I think in some ways better. So stay strong. And you too. Thank you for coming back. Yeah, thank you so much. I really much. enjoyed this, fellas. Thank you so much. I have and... too. This has been fun. <laughs> Y'all take care. Yeah, all right, take folks. care. Be well. Bye. Yep.